Shabbat Shalom, saints. <laughs> I just want to thank and praise Yahweh Almighty, the one who sits high and looks low on me. And it seems like everybody's kind of in a little bit of a lull today. But guess what? I'm not. <laughs> okay, so I want to start off by talking about our church um, feast is coming up. You know, there's a lot of stuff being posted online about the feast entering in, and so I'm in that mode. But I was thinking about how when we travel as a church, how we tend to travel in a group, right? But when we travel in a group, we try to make sure that every car has directions, right? Has an address, knows how to get there. And why do you think we do that? In case we get separated, right? Because whenever you're traveling in a group and you're following someone else, there are different things that get between you. Sometimes other cars, sometimes a light will delay somebody. And so we get distance between us and we lose sight of the person that we're following. So if we don't have the directions, right, we end up lost, okay? So whenever we're following somebody, the best way to follow is to be close, right? Because if you follow at a distance, you leave room for distractions. So I was thinking about one of the skits that the kids did a couple years ago, it was the everything skit. So in the skit, the girl played by Jamie and Yeshua played by Mark, they were very close and intimate, right? In the beginning of the song, right? But then the boyfriend comes along and causes a little bit of distance between the girl and Yahshua, right? And then the boy is into some other things and she starts to drink and party and vanity and all these different things. And as each thing enters her life, the separation between her and Yahweh, her and Yahshua gets greater and greater and greater until eventually there's so many things between her and Yahshua that she can't even see him, right? She's lost sight of him. And I was thinking about that today. So to, today's message is titled, Following at a Distance. Okay, so distance in relationships oftentimes leads to disaster, sometimes ultimate destruction, right? So what comes to mind when you think about somebody in a relationship, and this is not just like a marriage relationship, this can be a parent-child, this could be friendship, marriage, any type of relationship you may have, and the person comes to you and they say, you know, um, it seems like we're a little bit distant, right? That implies that there's something wrong with the relationship, right? Somebody comes to you and say, you know, I'm feeling like we're not connected. We're a little bit distant. That kind of means that we need to look at the relationship and see what's going on so we can bridge the gap, right? So one of the things that me and Micah talk to marriage couples about when we do counseling is whenever you recognize there's a disconnect in your relationship, you need to seek to bridge the gap quickly because it's easy to bridge a puddle, but you cannot bridge an ocean, Right? So when there's issues between you, pretending like there's nothing there, you know, ignoring it, hoping it'll fix itself, the puddle becomes a lake, the lake becomes a river, the river becomes an ocean. Eventually, there's so much between you that you can't even remember what the original separation was about. There's just so much. Sometimes distance indicates that the closeness that you once shared in that relationship is fading. Sometimes distance is the beginning of the end of a relationship. Distance can leave us vulnerable, open to danger, drifting away from something that is sure and solid. So today that's what we're going to look at, following at a distance. Now, most, if not all of us in here, have been baptized into the body of Yeshua. We have accepted Yeshua's atoning sacrifice on Calvary for the remission of our sin. We said, yes, y'all, I want what you have for me. Yes, I want to be redeemed. Yes, I want Yeshua to take my penalty for my sin upon himself and impute his righteousness unto me. We made a public proclamation of faith. We went down into a watery grave where the old me, my old self, my identity, who I was, who I am, and who I will be is left in that watery grave, and I was resurrected, hallelujah, into newness of life, right? I'm a brand new creation, 
And now I no longer represent Denise, I represent Yeshua, so it's no longer I, but Yeshua in me. All of us, if not most, should be able to say that. We made a choice, right? It's interesting we were talking about choices today, because I'm talking about choices too, right? We made a choice. Nobody forced you to accept Yeshua's sacrifice on Calvary for the remission of your sin. Yahweh blessed you with free will. Nobody forced you. You made a choice, right? And once you make that choice, you are called to follow Yahshua. You made a choice to be his disciple. Now, we know that a disciple is a student, but I want you to understand that we are not simply students, we are followers. And what that means is the teachings that our master gives us, which our master is Yahshua, right? Because we chose him. Our master teaches and we take those instructions and make application of them to our life. See, it's not just learning, it's learning with application. It does not benefit you to know the word and not apply it to your life. You have to actually apply the things that Yeshua is instructing us in to your life if you wanna be successful at being a disciple or a follower of Yeshua. The charge that Yeshua gave to his disciples long ago is the same charge he gives to all of us today. So for those of you who may not know, this is what Yeshua says to his disciples. In Mark chapter 8, verse 34, and I'm breaking this down in the Amplified because I want you guys to really understand what the verse is saying. He says, Yeshua called the crowd together with his disciples and said to them, if anyone wishes to follow me as my disciple, right? Because remember, there were crowds and crowds of people following after Yeshua. But a lot of them were simply following him because they wanted to be fed. They needed healing. They wanted to see miracles done. They had all these selfish motives. It wasn't really about choosing him, right? So he's letting them know, if anyone wishes to follow me as my disciple, he must deny himself set aside selfish interest, take up his cross, expressing a willingness to endure whatever may come, and follow me, believing in me, conforming to my example in living, and if need be, suffering or perhaps dying because of faith in me. This is Yeshua's words to his disciples and those that would choose to be his disciples. We must deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him. So as we can see from that verse, the conditions for true discipleship are hard. And Yeshua wants you to count the cost. He wants you to be certain that th there are expectations on you if you say you want to be a disciple of his, right? It's not a club for just anybody, right? Denying itself is not an easy thing. This flesh does not want to die. Crucifying this flesh is painful. This flesh will not go down without a fight. But I must learn to deny myself. We have to surrender ourselves completely to Yahshua. We are to identify with his suffering and death, and we are to be obedient to him following him and trusting his word, no matter what the cost, no matter what I have to sacrifice, no matter how difficult it becomes. This is the expectation that Yeshua has for those that choose with their free will to be his disciple. Now make no mistake, if you choose to follow from a distance and not fully commit to him and not be his disciple, you are not a part of his kingdom. You cannot be. You must be his disciple to go where he goes. Do you understand that, saints? This is not something that is optional for those that are looking forward to that glorious day. We are to deny ourselves and live for him. Now, to deny ourselves has nothing to do with self-denial. I want to make the clarification here. Self-denial is when we give up something. We give up this or we give up that now and again. We see this all the time when people make these uh, diets or, you know, I'm going to exercise and work out. I'm going to give up sugar. I'm going to give up this. That is self-denial. That is not denying self, okay? Denying self is total surrender of self. 
who I am, what I want, my hopes, my dreams, everything. It's offering my entire life as a living sacrifice, right? My entire life is set apart unto Yahweh to do with what he pleases. The scripture says we are not our own. We've been bought with a price. This vessel is his to do with as he pleases. He has a plan and a purpose for every single one of us. And our responsibility and job is simply to surrender and do what Yahweh has for us to do. We are to disassociate ourselves from everything me. Uh Uh-oh. Disassociate ourselves from everything me and live with a divine perspective where we're willing to say, not my will, but thy will be done because we are his disciples. I want you to know that the decision to follow Yeshua, the decision to die to self and live for him, the decision to say, not my will, but thy will be done, is not a one and done decision. Now, we heard Pastor Beth today and her testimony all up in my message, right? But I got to repeat this anyway. It wasn't a one and done for Yeshua. See, those words originated with Yeshua in the Garden of Gethsemane. Yeshua knew what was coming. And he said, Father, if at all possible, will you let this cup pass from me? But not my will, Father. Thy will be done. And for Yeshua, it was not a one and done. Let me tell you, he willed himself to yield to the will of the Father. But with every lash of the whip, he had to will himself again and again and again and again. When they punched him and mocked him and spit on him and nailed him, hammering him to the cross, he had to will himself again and again and again and again. This is not a one and done. Yeshua is our example. We too must choose him. Just like Pastor Beth said, it's not even a day-to-day thing. Sometimes it's an hour-to-hour thing. Sometimes a minute-to-minute thing. But we must choose him every time. Every time. Because becoming his disciple does not mean you will automatically hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. That's not what that means. And if you think it does, ask Judas. Was he or was he not Yeshua's disciple? Do you believe he ended well and heard, well done, my good and faithful servant? So simply being his disciple does not automatically give you entry into the kingdom of Yahweh. Today we're going to look at the life of one of Yeshua's closest disciples so that we can see what we can learn from him. That disciple is Peter. The gospel shows us where Peter followed Yeshua at a distance at one point in his relationship with Yeshua. So I'm going to move around the gospels a bit because I want to paint the whole picture. This story is actually mentioned in all four gospels. So I'm going to kind of jump around a little bit so that you guys can see the whole picture. I'm going to start by looking at Luke 5, 1 to 11. And I did not put these on the PowerPoint, so if you have your sword, you can get that out. And I'm going to go through Luke 5, verses 1 through 11. Just to give us a little background before we get into the actual message. Now, it happened that while Yeshua was standing by the lake of Genesaret, or the Sea of Galilee, with the people crowding all around him and listening to the word of Yahweh, Then he saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake, but the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little distance from the shore. And he sat down and began teaching the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon Peter, put out into the deep water and lower your net for a catch of fish. Simon replied, master, We worked hard all night to the point of exhaustion and caught nothing in our nets. But at your word, I will do as you say and lower the nets again. When they had done this, they caught a great number of fish and their nets were at the point of breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both of the boats with fish so that they began to sink. 
But when Simon Peter saw this, he fell down at Yeshua's knees saying, go away from me for I am a sinful man, O Yah. For he and all his companions were completely astounded at the catch of fish which they had taken. And so were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon Peter. Yeshua said to Simon, have no fear. From now on, you will be catching men. After they had brought their boats to land, they left everything they had and followed him, becoming his disciples, believing and trusting in him and following his examples. So this is Peter's first encounter with Yeshua. And he tells Yeshua, depart from me because I am wicked and sinful. And Yeshua tells him, I'm not going to do that because you, my friend, have been chosen. Hallelujah. You have been chosen to be one of mine. And you are going to be a fisher of men. Now, in Matthew chapter 4, we have the same account of Yeshua saying, follow me to James and John, and they too leave everything they have. That scripture brings out the fact that they leave their boat and their father to follow after Yeshua. So I just want to pause here for a minute. How many of us have put down everything to follow Yeshua? How many of us have forsaken all to follow Yeshua? See, the problem for most of us is we're carrying too much baggage, right? We want to take everything but the kitchen sink with us. We want Yeshua, but we want all that the world has to offer as well. And so we're walking around loaded down with a cart full of things that we don't even need because we think we need them. If you have Yeshua, you have all you need. Get rid of the luggage. You don't need it, right? Whatever you need, he will make provision for. You cannot enter into the kingdom like this. You cannot do the work of Yeshua like this. You can't take everything you own with you. He says, leave everything and follow me. I will make provision. And did he? Did he make provision for the 12? Yes, he did. He most definitely did, right? He will make provision. He will keep. He will protect. He will provide. He will do all those things. So, again, I ask, how many of us have forsaken all to follow him? Now, we're going to fast forward three years and pick up the story in Matthew chapter 26, looking at verse 31. Then Yeshua said to them, you will all fall away because of me this night, disillusioned about me, confused, and some even ashamed of me. For it is written in the scripture, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. This is Yeshua telling them of a prophecy that is written in the Old Testament scriptures. Now we know because it's prophecy, it's going to happen, right? There's no way it's not going to happen. It's a prophecy that Yahweh gave, and it's a prophecy that will be fulfilled. And Yeshua is letting them know, this is what's going to happen. They're going to strike me, your shepherd, down, and the sheep will scatter. The flock will scatter. So let's look at Peter and see how Peter responds to what Yeshua is telling them. Verse 33, Peter replied to him, though they all fall away because of you and doubt and disown you, I will never fall away. Yeshua said to him, I assure you and most solemnly say to you this night, before a rooster crows, you will completely deny me three times. Peter's response, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same thing. Peter is pretty adamant about what he's saying. Now, remember who he's talking to. He's talking to Yeshua, omniscient, the one who knows all things, right? And he's telling him what ain't going to happen. He's saying, I will not deny you. I'm not going to do it. There's just no way. It's never going to happen. There's some things I know I will not do, and that is one of them. I will never deny you, right? He's sure. He's confident, cocky, right? How many of us can relate to this? 
How many of us have read in scripture clear warnings about things we ought not to do? And we look at it and we say, oh, I would never do that. No, not me. I would never. Nope, never. I'll never do that. How many times have you told Yahweh you would never do something only to find yourself doing the very thing you said you would never do? Or how about this one? How many of you have said to Yahweh, I'll never do it again, only to repent for the same old sin over and over and over and over again, right? How many of us? I want you to understand that we deny Yeshua every single time we walk contrary to his word. The word of Yahweh is basic instruction before leaving earth, right? That's our instruction booklet. He has subscribed to us everything we need to be successful in our walk with him. It is a blueprint for how to represent him well in this realm. So first, if you don't read the word and you don't know the word, you can't apply the word. And if you can't apply the word, you are not a disciple. You are not. You must apply the word to be counted as a true follower of Yeshua. So people who are weak in the word are weak in their walk. And if you're weak in your walk, you will be weak in your witness. You got to be strong in the word. You got to know how to use your weapon of warfare. You got to know how to use the sword properly and correctly. So for those that aren't in the word, my daily bread, those that are fasting off the word, right? Daily, you should be in the word. Daily, you should be meditating on scripture. Daily, you should be seeking to go to deeper depths of understanding. Daily, you should be asking Yahweh to give you a new revelation. Daily, you should be learning how to study the scripture, not simply just read it. Daily, daily. And if you're not, you are susceptible to what I'm talking about today, following Yeshua at a distance. Now drop down to verse 69 and 60, 69 and 70. Now this is the same night, okay? Now just remember how strong Peter's words were. I will die for you. I will never deny you. I'm not, it's not going to happen. No, not me. Even if all of them do it, I will not do it, right? Prideful, right? Now, Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came up to him and said, you too were with Yeshua the Galilean, but he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you are talking about. This is the same night. This is this, I mean, you want to talk about a complete 180, right? This is the same. I mean, look, he's here. I will never deny you. I don't know the man. I mean, you can't get more dramatic, right? Complete 180. Peter, come on, Peter. But how many of us do this? How many of us promise y'all, I'm not going to do this, I'm not going to do that, and then we turn around and do it and have the audacity to think he didn't notice? Or maybe he forgot the promise we made to him. We need to be careful about how we speak to the Most High. Because when I make a promise to him and I continue to just repeat the same, it's now not a promise, it's a lie. It's a lie. And I'm not saying that we don't sometimes fall into a stronghold or the same old sin, but When you understand that it's a struggle, when you understand that the enemy has set a foothold in your life, and this is something that trips you up all the time, your prayer should be, Yahweh, give me the strength to overcome my sinful flesh. Yahweh, help me to overcome in this. It shouldn't be, I'm never going to do it again. I promise you I'm never going to do it again. Because then you look like that, 180, right? But then it gets worse, right? So let's jump down to 71 and 72. Now, reminding you, this is the same night. Same night. And when he had gone out to the gateway, another servant girl saw him, and she said to the bystanders, this man was with Yeshua the Nazarene. And again, he denied it. But this time, 
with an oath. I do not know the man. So look, the first time he denied him, right? The second time, it's more emphatic. He denied, I swear I don't know him. I swear I do, I do not know him. You're mistaken. You don't know what you're talking about. This oath is kind of like when we go into a court of law and we put our hand on the Bible and we swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me, y'all. He did one of them, right? He gave an oath. I don't know the man, right? So the situation goes from bad to worse, but this is crazy because this is the same night. This is the same night. But the, oh, let's look at the next two verses. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Surely you are one of them, too, for even your Galilean accent gives you away. Then he began to curse, that is, to invoke Yah's judgment on himself and swear an oath, I do not know the man. And at that moment, the rooster crowed. Oh, my goodness. This is the same night, right? This is the same night. He denies Yeshua once. The second time, he denies him with an oath, right? He, it's more emphatic. The third time, he just, it's just indignant, right? He was like, may Yahweh strike me down if I'm lying. I don't know the man. Calling curses upon himself, right? Calling, invoking Yahweh's wrath on him. He's bold, right? It just went from bad to worse. Isn't that how all of our sin is? You know, the first time we do it, somebody brings it to our attention. We make it small. We minimize it. Oh, well, yeah, but it ain't that big a deal. It's, yeah, I'm doing so good over here. I, that's okay. And then Yahweh, because he loves us too much to leave us in our mess, he'll send another saint. He'll send a word. He'll send a song. He'll send something else to bring conviction, give you confirmation, right? And then that second time, not only do you make it small, but now you begin to justify it. You, you, you go from minimizing your sin to justifying your sin. Well, I wouldn't have did that if he didn't do what he did. Like, it's her fault, not my fault. Like, you know, I justified. You know, Yahweh knows my heart, right? Yep, he knows your heart. He knows your heart is far from him. That's what he knows, Right? But then Yahweh, in his mercy and his grace, oh, hallelujah, his loving kindness, he sends yet another to call you out on your sin. And now you're just like Peter. You're indignant, and you try to excuse it all together. It's not even sin to you anymore. Well, I just don't agree with that. I don't, I don't see that how you see that. Yeah, I don't agree with that. So I'm good. Let me tell you something. If the word of Yahweh is the absolute truth, which we believe that it is, it is not relative truth, it is absolute truth, it is the truth for every single individual that ever lived, is living, and will live. If it is the absolute truth, you will be judged by it. And guess what? Belief is not necessary for the truth to be the truth. You don't have to believe it. If it's true, you will be judged by it. So it doesn't matter if you don't agree with it. So Peter has basically made a mess of it, made a fool of himself, right? If we look down to Luke 22, it goes a little bit, it's the same story, but it gives us another detail. So it says, but Peter said, man, I don't know what you're talking about. Immediately while he was still speaking, a rooster crowed. This is the part I want you to see. Yeshua turned and looked at Peter. Yeshua turned and looked at Peter. Yeshua's face is battered and bruised and bloody from the crown of thorns that was jammed on his head. And he looked at Peter and Peter made eye contact. Can you imagine how both of them must have felt in that moment. I mean, think about that. The scripture says, Peter remembered the word of Yeshua and how he told him, before a rooster crows today, you will deny me 
three times. And no doubt his own words came back to plague him. I will die for you. I will never deny. I won't do it, right? But in the midst of him doing it, Yeshua is looking at him. And the scripture says he goes away and he weeps bitterly. How many of you know that Yeshua, that Yahweh is omnipresent? How many of you know and understand that Yeshua is omniscient? That means he's present everywhere at all times. And not only is he present, he's all-knowing. Meaning he knows you better than you know yourself. He knows your motives. He knows why you do what you do. So there's no secret from him. There's no secret from him. So when you're indulging your flesh, when you are entertaining sinful behavior and you think you're all alone behind closed doors, and as long as nobody knows, I'm okay. Yeshua is looking at you. Are you looking at him? How are you living, saints? See, the scripture tells me in order to be a disciple of Yeshua, I must deny myself. Peter, who is a disciple of Yeshua, is following from a distance. There's a disconnect, right? And instead of denying himself, he is denying Yeshua. How many of us are in that situation? We're not connected to the Most High. We don't like the food, right? This is not real for me, right? You're disconnected. So you deny Yeshua every time you walk contrary to the word of Yahweh. You deny Yeshua when you allow your feelings, your emotions to lead you when you see clearly what the word of Yahweh says. You deny Yeshua when you put other people in front of him on the throne of your heart. You deny Yeshua. And that means, saints, that you are following from a distance. You're following from a distance. So many of us, when we started out, we had such zeal for the things of Yahweh such a desire to serve him. I mean, somebody lit us on fire and that thing just consumed us, right? We went around telling everybody we know, guess what happened to me? And it can happen to you too, right? Zealous for him, committed to him. Well, Peter was the same way. Remember that Peter was the one who left everything to follow Yeshua, everything. And I want you to think about it from this perspective. We're on the other side of Calvary. We get to read all about what Yeshua did, all the miracles, all the prophecies he fulfilled. We get to see the evidence that he is who he said he is, right? Peter and them, they're just starting out with him. They don't know what we know, but yet they were willing to leave everything and follow him. They had families. They had jobs. You know, they had people they needed to take care of, all that. But they left everything to follow him. What are you holding on to, saints? In Matthew 26, 58, it says, But Peter followed him at a distance, as far as the courtyard of the elegant home of the Jewish high priest, and went inside and sat with the guards to see the outcome. He was following from a distance. Distance in a relationship indicates that there is something wrong. Peter was one of Yeshua's closest disciples. He wasn't just one of the 12. He was one of the three. He's believed to be the leader of the inner circle, right? So this is his boy that is getting ready to be subjected to all kinds of injustice, right? But he sits with the guards. He he sits with the enemies of Yeshua his friend, his boy, his master, his teacher. And wait a minute, Peter is the one who knew that Yeshua was Messiah. He knew. He said, you are the Messiah. And Yahweh, Yeshua said, how do you know that? My father has given you that revelation. So he knew who Yeshua was, but yet he stayed silent in the distance and he sat with the enemies of Yeshua. It can happen to Peter. It can happen to any of us. Some of us have been walking with Yeshua for 10, 20, 30 years. 
and have little to no growth, little to no fruit, constantly chasing your tail, eating the basic food, right? Has your love waxed cold? Has your commitment fallen away? Are you still dedicated? Are you falling back? Not as close to Yeshua as you used to be? I want you to know that if that's you, you are in a state of being backslidden. You're a backslider. And I want you to hear this. Backsliding means to slide back, right? But it doesn't only mean falling backwards and losing ground you once had. It's also failing to go forward spiritually. If we're stagnant in our growth and we're not moving forward in Yeshua, then we are naturally going backward. And the reason is this. You've been in the church 10 plus years. You got people coming into the assembly who've been here a year. And you're standing here stagnant, still, not progressing. You're not backsliding, but you ain't making progress either, right? So these new people coming in, they're passing you up. They're way up here. You're still there. You're backslidden. You're backslidden. There's no standing still in this. You're either progressing or you're regressing. There is no stagnant. There is no standstill. Just like Peter, we all have the potential to fall. You're either drawing nearer to him or you're following him from a distance. Now, Peter's denial to me, you know, a lot of people will say, well, he was afraid. You know, he didn't want to be crucified, beaten. He didn't want to be tried with Yeshua. He, his flesh rose up and he was in fear. But I want us to look at this really. Because I don't think that anybody just wakes up and they're a backslider. I think that there's groundwork being laid before you desert. Right? We're laying groundwork before we desert. Nobody just suddenly backslides. A series of steps always precedes it because every single day we're either building up our spiritual nature or we're building up our flesh, right? Which one are you feeding? That's the one that's dominant. That's the one that's growing. That's the one that's strong. We're either drawing nearer to him or falling back. Peter was boasting in his own strength, prideful, self-assured. I will die for you, right? I will not deny you. I promise, right? We know the scripture says pride comes before destruction. We, just like Paul, should put no confidence in this flesh. You should have no confidence in your flesh. Your confidence is in Yahweh and what he can do in your life, not what you can do. The scripture says I can do all things in Yeshua, through Yeshua who strengthened me. It doesn't say I can do all things, but in him I can, whatever he's calling me to do. We should put no confidence in our flesh. Peter struggled with prayer. Uh-oh. When he was with Yeshua in the Garden of Gethsemane, Yeshua told him, Peter, um, him James, and John to pray. But when he came back, he found them asleep. In Luke twenty two forty, 40, it says, when he arrived at the place called Gethsemane, he said to them, pray continually that you may not fall into temptation. I want you to hear these words. Nothing's changed. Yeshua was the same yesterday, today, and forever. The words he had for his disciples then are the same words he has for his disciples now. And if you are a disciple of Yeshua, Hear the words of Yeshua. Pray continually. Pray continually. Why? So that you will not fall into temptation. When he rose from prayer, this is Yeshua, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping from sorrow. And he said to them, why are you sleeping? Get up and pray that you may not fall into temptation. Some of y'all are sleeping. Wake up. Wake up. 
if you think you have a relationship with Yahshua and you have a weak prayer life, you are fooling yourself. How intimate is a relationship where the people don't talk to each other, where they don't share anything, right? Think about that. Prayer changes things. Prayer is essential to this walk with Yahweh. It is not optional. Peter followed from a distance. Distance from Yeshua in closeness and fellowship is a sure indicator of spiritual regression. And let me tell you something. It's not just fellowship with Yahweh. It's fellowship with the people of Yahweh. I didn't say it. That's what the word of Yahweh says. A disciple of Yeshua wants to be around the other disciples of Yeshua. They have common purpose, common mission, common mindset. All things one, right? It is a group. This has never been an individual walk. This is a communal walk. We are one body made up of many parts. My hand got no business hanging out over there while the rest of us are over here. We're connected. Fellowship is with Yahweh and with the saints. This goes to the love saints. Love Yahweh with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. Where is the love? Where is the connection, right? He's following from a distance because he has a half-hearted commitment. See, I want Yeshua in my life, but not too close. You know, I, I, I want to keep him at, at arm's length. Because I still kind of want to be able to do the things that I want to do, right? I, I can't have him right here. He might be able to see everything I'm doing, right? So I, I keep him at a distance, keep him at arm's length. But that's how we treat our acquaintances, right? We keep our acquaintances at arm's length, right? Is he just your acquaintance? Do you even have real intimacy with the Most High? Or do you just talk a good game? Do you love him? Do you love him more than you love all this other stuff? Do you choose him again and again and again? Every day, every hour, every minute, every second? Do you? Those that follow at a distance become prey. Prey, P-R-E-Y. Now, if you ever watch the animal planet, you know that the predators always go after the stragglers. They always go after the ones that are following from a distance, right? They're strength in numbers, saints. We are to stick together. When you fall away from the pack, you become prey, P-R-E-Y. And it's just a matter of time before the enemy devours you. When I think about those that have gone out from the assembly, Every single one of them, they have their reasons, right? And their reasons are different, but they're really not. See, one will say, I just love this girl. I know we're unequally yoked. I know she's not who Yahweh has for me, but this is what I want, right? So I, you know, I'm just going to do, do that. And then they go into this relationship and they forsake Yahweh, their king, right? Other people, I don't believe. I, I, I just don't believe, how you believe anymore. I, you know, I don't believe, so I'm just going to go do, you know. I, I, don't, I don't get along with the people in the church. I never felt accepted. I always felt like I was on the outside. People don't connect with me. People, they got their reasons. The reason, they want to do them. Did you hear what I said? You can come up with every excuse in the book. You can have a hundred reasons the real reason is I don't want to totally surrender to the word of Yahweh. The real reason is I want to pick and choose where I yield. The real reason is this walk is hard because crucifying me is not something that I'm really into. You know what I'm saying? You guys with this whole accountability thing, this is too much. I'm going to go to church down the street where I can live in sin and do everything I want and still be saved. This, mm-mm. They want to do what they want to do. People need to own their choices. When you're talking to people about things they're doing that are contrary to the word of Yahweh, they will come up with every reason. Well, I'm going to pray about it. Well, if the word of Yahweh says, thou shall not, <laughs> what are we praying about? 
He told you. He already told you. What are you praying about? Thou shall not. Right? I'm going to pray about it. I'm going to, I, you know, I, I'm looking for some confirmation. Your confirmation is in the word of Yahweh. What does the word of Yahweh say? Yahweh knows best what's best for us, and we need to trust him. We need to go where he tells us to go and do what he tells us to do and say what he tells us to say and be the light that he's called us to be and let him order our steps. Let him give us direction. All we need to do is surrender. Distance causes us to lose focus and distractions get in, which causes more separation. And once we're separated, our chances of being lost increase exponentially. We have to keep our eyes on Yeshua. You can never be too close to Yeshua. There's no such thing. We're literally going to be one, glorified in his glory. There's no such thing as too close. You'll never be too close, right? Peter had fallen. Peter was devastated. Peter did what he did. And then he repented. The scripture talks about how he wept bitterly. When sin is brought to your attention, do you weep over your sin? Does it break your heart? Do you understand that you crucify Yeshua afresh every time you sin? It's not a small thing, saints. It's a big thing. Does it cause you to weep bitterly that you crucify the son again? Because that's what Peter did. And then Peter went and got together with the disciples. He went back to his pack, right? And in John 21, 3, it says, Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said, are we, and we are coming with you. So they went out and got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. He goes back to fishing. He goes back to his comfort zone. He goes back to what he knows, right? How many of us do that? We mess up. We do something we ought not to do. It's brought to our attention. We realize it. We feel bad about it. We think now there's no hope for us, and we go back to doing what we used to do. We give up. We quit. We serve a mighty Elohim who's more than able to restore us, to forgive us and restore us, right? We don't ever need to quit or give up or feel that we're without hope because our Savior died for those sins that we committed. And there is nothing too hard for him. He goes back to fishing. But guess what Yeshua does? Yeshua comes along and he sets up the same miracle that he did in the very beginning when Peter first met him. He he yells out to him, hey, did you catch any fish? And they say the same thing. We've been up all night and we didn't catch any fish. And he says, cast your net on the other side. He did this twice. And in that moment, Peter remembers the first time. He knows who it is. And the scripture says he dives into the water. He throws himself. Let's look at that. 21.7. Then that disciple John, whom Yeshua loved, esteemed, said to Peter, it is Yeshua. So when Simon Peter heard that it was Yeshua, he put on his outer tunic, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea and swam ashore. He heard it, he knew it, and he went. Yeshua reminded him of the very beginning. Some of you need to be reminded of the very beginning again. You need to remember when you first heard the good news of the gospel. You need to remember when you were on fire for him, when you were out here Bible beating people because you just wanted them to get what you got, right? You need to remember that when you just couldn't contain it. The zeal was there. It was like, oh, let me tell you what happened to me. Hallelujah. I serve a risen Savior. Hallelujah. I've been forgiven and reconciled. Hallelujah. I'm a child of the King. And guess what? You could be a child of the King too. Let me take you to the king, right? Some of us need to be reminded of how we were in the beginning. Yeshua is giving him a fresh start. Yeshua is giving him an opportunity to recommit his life. Yeshua is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the forgiveness that he had for his disciples then he has for us right now, today. Hallelujah. 
the restoration that he had for his disciples then he has for us now today hallelujah he will do the same for us if you are following from a distance close the gap everybody say close the gap close the gap close the gap it's within your power to do it close the gap years ago when you accepted the call Somewhere along the way, you may have lost your focus. You may have gotten distracted. You may have began to lose sight of Yeshua and put other things, other people before him. But it's not too late. It's not over for you. The gap can be closed. All you need to do is repent and receive his forgiveness, and he will restore you. Do it now. Don't put up for tomorrow what you need to do today. Do it now. Right now, resolve it in yourself. I will follow after Yahshua. I will walk with him hand in hand. I will stay in the shadow of the Almighty. Hallelujah. I will not follow from a distance. I will not allow things to hinder my growth in him. I will serve him and represent him well in this realm. Resolve that in your heart today and do it now. You hear the cock-a-doodle-doo, right? You hear the cock-a-doodle-doo. Those that hear what the Spirit of Yahweh is saying, let them have ear to hear. Hear what the Spirit of Yahweh is saying. What have you been doing? What are you pursuing? What are you holding out on Yahshua for? Why are you giving him what's left over of your time, your treasure, your talent? You've lost your focus and become entangled in the things of the world. But it's not too late to recommit, to reignite the fire. Yeshua goes on to say to Peter, do you love me? Three times. Do you love me? He's saying the same thing to us today, saints. Do you love me? Or is it just what I can do for you? Do you love me? Do you? Yeshua is looking at you. Are you looking at him? We sing a song, turn your eyes upon Yahshua. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Hallelujah.